Hello, my name's Paul Sudnick, and I have a very broad interest in entrepreneurship that I've built up over most of my career. In fact, I think that entrepreneurship is really an attitude to life rather than simply about starting up businesses on a serial basis. And for me, internationalization, which is what we're going to talk about today for most of the time, is really an extension of that attitude to life. I've tried to practice that kind of approach throughout my first career, where I worked with a series of multinationals where I've done both corporate startups and corporate turnarounds. And for the last eight years or so, I've actually been developing a second career in academia and the universities. And during that independent phase of my career, I've established my own business, I've set up a business college in a post-conflict environment, and I've transferred UK university business and entrepreneurship programs to fragile states. As we begin to talk about internationalization, we're recording this today on a beautiful summer's day. Outside, the sun is shining, and people are beginning to think about going on their holidays. Um, entrepreneurs have holidays too, it's just that they don't switch off when they are on holiday. As you travel from the airport to the resort hotel, you see bustling streets full of people, shops buzzing, restaurants buzzing, full of happy people, and you think, there must be opportunities here somewhere, and then you go and lie on the beach next day, and after 20 minutes you're thinking, I should be up and about and looking for new business opportunities somewhere so that I can internationalize my business and take advantage of this opportunity whilst I'm here on this holiday. And you fret about how you're going to take those first steps. What should I do? What should I be doing instead of lying here on the beach? And the point is, I think, that actually, by being on holiday internationally and thinking in this way, you've already taken the first steps towards internationalization. What I want to do here in the very, very short time that we have available today is to outline some of the practical steps that you might want to consider as you internationalize your small business, but at the same time, see if there are any support mechanisms that we might be able to generate from the academic research that is already existing in universities. The first thing that I think we should mention is a tool that's called the strategic tripod. In fact, it's not really a tool, it's a collection of three or four different tools which take a different view on putting together the blocks of strategic analysis as you begin to move your business forward. When we consider the strategic tripod, we think about three specific elements. We think about an institution-based view where we begin to take a very, very broad view of the environment that we're working in, and we try and understand all the external factors that may affect our business. We then would consider an industry-based view, and here we're concerned about what's happening in our value chain. How do our suppliers interact with each other and with us? How do we interact with our customers, and what do our customers expect of us? And finally, within the strategic tripod, we might look at what we would call a resource-based view. And this asks us to consider, do we have the capacity, both in terms of tangible and intangible resources, to do the job at hand? If we bring together these three views, the institution, industry, and resource-based view, then together we have a series of tools that allow us to as to estimate and to determine whether our international efforts are likely to su succeed or not. Let's examine a little bit further the resource-based view. The resource-based view invites you, the entrepreneur, to consider whether we have the ability to create the resources and to maximize them in order to give us that all-elusive competitive advantage that we need in order to be successful as we internationalize. And essentially, we begin to ask ourselves, do we have the opportunities that present themselves now, and can we take advantage of them? And more importantly, can we be ready for those opportunities in the future? 
It all sounds a little bit idealistic, of course, because each company, each entrepreneur is an individual and has their own particular set of circumstances. Those companies are unique and have a particular bundle of resources that they can use. And you as an entrepreneur have a particular appetite for risk. You can take more or less risk depending on your personality, depending on the environment within which you are at the moment, and depending on recent events, no doubt. So it's very hard to draw hard and fast rules about when we have enough resources and what we need to do. It's certainly something that you need to consider in order to be able to take opportunity when it arises. One of the traditional models for discussing internationalization is the Uppsala internationalization model. Uppsala is actually a small town in central Sweden which has a very, very famous university going back to the, to the Middle Ages. And academics at that institution have established what they call a stage model of internationalization. They see firms taking the first simple step towards exports as the primary moving objective of beginning to, be, of beginning to internationalize. As your company evolves on the international stage, you may then move towards a process of establishing a sales office in the countries that you're addressing. And that sales office, as that becomes successful, might create for you an interest in manufacturing locally in the international market. And then you might decide to take on board a partner through licensing or via a joint venture. It's a very progressive model which sees internationalization for small, medium firms as a step process, starting with the simplest step and moving on through various stages to the more difficult ones. The model basically assumes that you have a pre-existing domestic market, of course. Um, it's perhaps a little bit deterministic because it seems to put all internationalization processes into one channel uh, and claims almost that one size fits all. And of course, as you know, as an entrepreneur, you're unique. And so the model may or may not fit you, but it is a useful guide. And whatever happens and whichever way you adapt the model to your strategic analysis, the home market, the market that you started your business in, remains the hub. Entrepreneurs, as they begin to expand into other markets, will tend to look at psychological and geographical fit. So they'll go to markets where they feel psychologically comfortable and where the geography and the topography, both physical and in terms of the business, suits their own activity and their own personalities. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. For the moment, let's just park the Uppsala model as a guide to a step-by-step -step internationalization and consider it a little bit later. A development of the Uppsala model is a piece of work by Johansson and Matson, and they identify four stages of internationalization. This, of course, is a very typical two-by-two -two MBA matrix analysis, but it is useful because what it does, it tells us that our propensity to internationalize is dependent firstly on our own knowledge of and willingness to internationalize, but more importantly, it begins to analyze our networks and our ability to fit into networks that already have a perspective on internationalization. And so let's just look at two of these quadrants. Let's, let's look at the top right hand, sorry, the top left hand quadrant where we consider early starters. These are entrepreneurs, perhaps like yourself, that don't have access to an internationalized network and have a low degree of international perspective within your business today. But that's why you're sitting on this beach that we talked about right at the beginning, isn't it? You're beginning to look at the opportunities to internationalize. And your target, I guess, is to move into the bottom right-hand quadrant where you are an internationalizer amongst others, where you begin to thrive in an environment that is made up of people who have an international perspective, and you are comfortable working internationally, and your network is made up of international companies. The implication, of course, of the 
Johansson and Matson model that we've just taken, that we just talked about, put in juxtaposition with the Uppsala model, is that the implication is that you begin to move onto a stage-by-stage -stage process of internationalization as a result of your pre-existing or developed networks. And this is a useful juxtaposition because it gives us a space through which we can actually undertake a practical discussion of internationalization in entrepreneur-led small firms. And the reason that we can do this is because the juxtaposition becomes very pragmatic. And at the end of the day, as a small business, as an entrepreneur leading that business, you make use of your contacts on a day-to-day -day basis. They are the lifeblood of the success that you are building for yourself. One of the limitations, I guess, of network theory is that it does assume that there is a pre-existing network and that um, that network will develop almost itself. But networks are like flowers in the garden. If you don't water them, they wither and die. And the model doesn't really tell us much about how we as an entrepreneur have to actually work on the development and sustenance of networks. And I think also the importance of local networks domestically are often understated at this stage of the discussion because it's through our domestic networks that we begin to find the contacts that will help carry us uh, abroad as we internationalize. Probably you've had enough of a theoretical conversation now, so maybe we should spend some time on bringing all this underpinning theory together and wonder how it is that this all might help us. As you've probably gathered, I'm not convinced that any one of these models in and of itself is able to guide our internationalization process. But I think that by taking them together, we're able to pick a path through the forest and to find a key that is going to help us bring together the links that will make for a successful internationalization. And the key for me is awareness awareness of a wide number of factors that we'll now go on to talk about. Linking back to the strategic tripod discussion, the first thing we need to be aware of is what is happening in our environment. What's happening around us? What are the innovation trends? We as entrepreneurs are natural innovators. We either innovate products or we innovate processes or we bring together bundles of processes and products to create new offerings for the market. But other people are doing the same thing. And what are the trends in our industry and in our environment? What are the niche market opportunities that we might see as we lie on the beach enjoying our holiday? What is happening in this particular environment that isn't happening in my own domestic environment? What's happening in my domestic value chain what are my suppliers and my customers doing? Are there opportunities to follow them into international markets, perhaps, and to take advantage of their pre-existing and developing networks? And as I consider the international market that I'm about to address, who and where are the potential international suppliers? Who and where are the potential international clients? And where are the channel partners who will help guide my product or service through the value chain as it addresses the customers. And importantly, what do I know about the public and private sources of support for funding and to help me finance my international adventure? I think the other aspect of risk you need to be aware of, and of course you are, being a successful entre entrepreneur, is risk. And we might look at risk from two perspectives maybe a higher level of risk in terms of the political, economic, and socio-political risk, which are really environmental and very, very much external to what we do. Uh, this is the risk of revolution or the risk of economic collapse in the market that I'm about to address. And they're perhaps not within my remit to influence, but they're certainly within my remit to avoid if I don't want to take that risk on. Second, secondly, I might want to look at technical, resource-related and operations risk. And as I consider that kind of risk, what I begin to see are things that I can actually influence as an entrepreneur. 
And as a wealth maximizing entrepreneur, you have a habit of selecting methods of doing business, and in this case, methods of internationalization, with the lowest risk, while at the same time achieving the greatest level of return. And this is part of your skill as an entrepreneur running and developing your business. It's what you do every day, isn't it? The difference only between taking that risk in your domestic market and taking it internationally is the contextual difference of being somewhere that you're not particularly familiar with. But the opportunistic behavior that's involved goes with the territory. You do it every day. You need then to be perhaps aware of the opportunistic behavior and the consequences of that behavior as you develop internationally. Internationalization is much like starting the business that you have today in the first place, just that you're doing it somewhere else. And as you begin to move internationally, you knowingly increase the amount of risk that you have because you have your original domestic risk and now you're taking on the risk internationally. But you expect your domestic risk to stay on an even keel, don't you? You expect your business to continue to do well because it's providing your platform for internationalization. So as you internationalize, what you're really doing is returning to levels of risk that you perhaps undertook at the very, very beginning of your career as an entrepreneur. And on a net basis, the amount of risk that you have is probably very similar to that that you had at the outset of your business. And if you look at opportunistic behavior in an international market like that, then really internationalization becomes a risk reward lever because every step of internationalization ratchets up the risk, but no further than where you were at the outset of your business. And once you have that particular step of internationalization under control, then you're able once more to consider increasing the risk ratio that you take on board in pursuit of further rewards. And as you consider that opportunistic behavior, you go back to the Uppsala model and you say, where am I on this ladder, if you like? Am I at the export stage? Should I move beyond export and move straight away into a manufacturing operation in my target international market? Will exporting be enough for me now? And as my business develops, will exporting be enough for me in the future? Or will I certainly want to do other things? Perhaps I should just go the whole hog and take on board a wholly owned foreign enterprise and become an international entrepreneur with stakeholdings and shareholdings across international borders. After all, anything less than going the whole hog is going to involve sharing the benefits of internationalization with other partners anyway. Perhaps I don't want to do that. Perhaps I feel confident enough to actually make the step and own my business, not only domestically, but internationally as well. Which brings us back, I suppose, to the question of resources and the resource-based view. As I begin to develop the resources necessary to move internationally, one of the key parts of that step are going to be the relationships that I have. What are the functions of my relationships as I develop this internationalization process? Are my relationships there to open doors? Are they there to develop further contacts so that I can open further doors in the future? Or are my relationships there to close deals? What kind of relationships am I looking for? And where do my important relationships originate from? Do I create them myself? Or am I creating them on the back of an evolving network? As you develop relationships, a key tool of networking, of course, is to always leave one contact, finish a meeting with one contact, with a further two addresses in your iPad. What long-term strategy of relationship building am I, build, am I pursuing? Am I actually pursuing a strategy for relationship building? Or is this ad hoc? And I think that successful entrepreneurs have long-term consequential strategies for building relationships. And those relationships need to be strong, deep, and interpersonal. Because whilst the textbooks will talk to you about having relationships internationally, I firmly believe that those relationships need to be one-to-one -one between people. 
And I want to have those firm relationships because ultimately, as we said when we were considering the quadrant that we looked at earlier on, we want to be in the bottom right-hand corner. We want to be a strong international amongst others. And we do that through gaining the respect of individuals for our work by contributing and by learning from them. Finally, as we begin to talk about individuals, we must also, I suppose, be aware of the cultural differences between our domestic environment and the environment that we are now considering to work in. There's a phrase that I think encapsulates the risks of working internationally and across cultures, and the phrase is the liability of being foreign. Many companies and many individuals think that just because the partner organization or the individual partners with whom we're working speak the same language, that they must be the same as us. And that the way we do things around here, just because it looks the same, is the same as it is back home. And that's not true. Business history is littered with UK companies, for example, that have thought that the United States will be a great market to expand into without recognizing that the US is at least three separate markets with very, very different business processes in those different places with different consumer expectations. The, exam the example of Walmart in Germany, where they failed badly, not because Germans don't like discount stores, just that Germans like their discount stores to be tidy. And should you, when you meet a new partner, should you shake hands? Or should you not shake hands? Should you have one peck on the cheek, two pecks, or perhaps even three? These are all these cultural differences that you need to bear in mind as you begin to evolve internationally. But I'm not too worried. I think as a successful entrepreneur, you're going to handle these differences. Just be aware of them. As we come to an end, I've been asked to summarize what I think it is to be an entrepreneur. And I've thought long and hard about um, these aphorisms, if you like. And I think entrepreneurs essentially see things from an unconventional perspective. I think they have an open mind to everything. Crucially, successful entrepreneurs have an ability to listen to themselves, but they also listen to others. I think they're also clear about having one long-term aim and sticking to that aim, whatever happens. From my own personal experience, I also think it's important that you share your dream with those close with you, those close to you, and also, finally, recognize that failure is a foundation for success. I wish you luck. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed talking to you about internationalizing your entrepreneurial business.